It's okay. It's ready. Huh? Stop. Starts. Once again, uh, let me check with you. Uh, am I audible? Am I visible to you? Yes. 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 Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the the topic uh, which is given to me for this presentation is uh, Eucharist bridging liturgy and life. Now let me begin with a well-known problematic issue. <clears throat> we say in our Christian faith, God became human in his son and pitched his tent among us. I'm referring to John chapter 1 verse 14. God became human and uh, pitched his tent among us. Now God continues to remain with us even today. He has not shed his humanity in his incarnation. But however, in spite of uh, professing faith in incarnation, there is a general tendency to remove God from the ordinariness of our lives and push him back into the heavens, so to say. And uh, among other expressions of uh, faith, Eucharist in particular suffers from such a practice. And since uh, you know human beings try to push God back into the uh, into into the heavens, so to say, what happens is as a result of that we see the following. First of all, we identify Eucharist as a meal, as a memorial, as a sacrifice, and a celebration of communion with Christ and with one another. We say this in our faith profession, in our theology or in the catechism. But hunger, injustice, selfishness, oppression of the weak, hatred, and breaking down of communities are on the rise and have become practically unrelated to Eucharist. We call Eucharist source and summit of a Christian life and mission. This is a famous adage. We heard it several times during the year of the Eucharist. Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life, we say it. But for many Christians, Eucharistic celebration has become nothing more than an obligation to be fulfilled. Many feel that Eucharist has no connection to their life, life situation. Third, we say Eucharist is the self-gift of God to believers. And the question is, if so, why is it that there is a lethargy in many believers for receiving this uh, precious gift. Now, if you look at the word liturgy, it comes from a Greek word, and that word is liturgia or liturgos. It simply means public works. Liturgos simply means in, in the Greek, public works. But at times, our liturgy seems to be too removed from public life. See, this is the discrepancy perhaps we can be aware of. Now, the question is, how do we remedy such a situation? In one sentence, if I were to respond to this, as much as a Eucharist being the center of life, it is life in its rawness that needs to be brought to the center of Eucharist in order that the Eucharist may transform life. I repeat, as much as Eucharist being the center of our life, it is life in its rawness, ordinariness, that needs to be brought to the center of Eucharist in order that the Eucharist may transform our lives. Now it is against this backdrop, backdrop that I would like to present a few reflections. An important question to begin with, an important question. Is Eucharist the center and summit of life or the program or the very fabric of the totality of life? I begin with this question. If the Eucharist is seen as the center and summit of life, it implies life is a larger reality of which 
the center and summit is the Eucharist. In practice, such a view reduces Eucharist to what we say mass, what we call mass. That is the periodical coming together of the faith community to celebrate, which lasts for about 45 to 60 minutes. That is the result. If we say that Eucharist is the summit and center of our life, it means it is a certain uh, common celebration and we come together periodically to celebrate it because it is, uh, it is restricted to the summit or to the center of life. Now, such an understanding reflects what is called a wellspring model, which, he, which we can find in uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 55. What does that mean? It means, it says, when someone is thirsty, he or she should go to the spring and drink. The one who is hungry is invited to come to the Lord for bread. But the problem here is, <clears throat> those who believe that they have found other means of satisfying their hunger and thirst, or those whose hunger and thirst for various reasons are not satisfied at the Eucharistic celebration, those, they tend to lose meaning in Eucharist. On the other hand, if a Eucharist is seen as the program or the very fabric of the entire life, then following are the implications. If a Eucharist is the very fabric of life, a total, if there is a total correspondence between life and uh, Eucharist can be discovered. In fact, life becomes part of a larger Eucharist, more than Eucharist becoming one event of life. I repeat, life has to become part of a larger Eucharist, more than Eucharist becoming one event of life. Now, New Testament has uh, very important references that point towards such a vision of the Eucharist. I shall refer to them a little later. Now, Eucharist signifies what the world is to become as the so-called Lima document of 1982 puts it. Like Eucharist, the world is to become an offering and a hymn of praise to the Creator, a universal communion in the body of Christ, a kingdom of justice, love and peace in the Holy Spirit. This is what that document, the Lima document says in number four. In fact, Pope John Paul II in his uh, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, number eight, that text points at uh, even the cosmic dimension of Eucharist. I will not go into that, the details of that cosmic dimension of Eucharist. So you can already see that Eucharist is not simply a 45 minutes uh, of uh, worship, but it has got uh, a very uh, a large reality. It has got even cosmic dimensions. Now, as I said, we have some grounds in the New Testament to consider Eucharist as the total reality of life and not just a periodical recurring, periodically recurring event or occasion in life. Eucharist indeed is the very fabric of life and not just one event among many, such as we eat, we drink, we play, we study, we work, and we also celebrate Eucharist. Then Eucharist becomes one act among many. No, Eucharist is much more than that. I shall come to the details of that a little later. Now, referring to a Vatican II document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, number 71 says, this text says, the radical newness brought about by Christ in the Eucharist is that the worship of God in our lives cannot be limited to something private and individual, but tends by its very nature to permeate every aspect of our existence. Already it hints at the larger, the vaster dimension of the Eucharistic reality. It has to permeate every aspect of our existence. Now, does the New Testament support this vision 
of the Eucharist. Let me begin with a familiar text from the New Testament. I take the uh, Paul's, letter, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 20 to 22. The text says, I shall read out for you, when you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord, Lord's Supper. For when, when the time comes to eat, each one of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I, should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. Now, although the meal that is referred to in this particular text is the meal that preceded the Eucharistic celebration, the context referred to is undoubtedly Eucharistic. <clears throat> Clearly, Eucharist is much more than eating and drinking at the Lord's table, what we call Mass. Eucharist basically has to do with the concrete relationships in life. The fact that Eucharist is the very fabric of life becomes clear in the life of Jesus himself. Why do I say this? <clears throat> Eucharist is not merely Last Supper. Many people, many Christians think Eucharist is a uh, Eucharist. No, Last Supper is actually the Eucharist. So Eucharist is not merely Last Supper in the life of Jesus. The Last Supper perhaps stands for what we call Mass. But the Last Supper was the celebrative dimension of the whole life of Jesus, especially of his ministry of healing, preaching, teaching, table fellowships, and casting out demons. And very significantly, Eucharist became the celebrative expression of his suffering and death, where his blood was shed and body was broken. The Last Supper would have been an empty symbol of eating and drinking, if it was not preceded by a life of self-giving in his ministry. In fact, Mark chapter 6 verse 31 tells us there were so many who were coming and going, there was no time for them even to have their meals. That is the type of ministry that Jesus and his disciples carried out. And if the ministry is not really uh, uh, gets, if, if, we, if we don't think of his ministry as part of his Eucharist, then the words of consecration would have been meaningless if Jesus hadn't enacted them in his ministry and then on the cross, literally breaking himself and shedding his blood. In fact, the following four kinds of meal in the life of Jesus, and not merely the Last Supper, have the Eucharistic significance. And what are those four types of meal? First, feeding of the 5,000 we have in John chapter 6. The second, table fellowships with the outcasts, the sinners and the tax collectors. We have it in Luke chapter 15. And thereby creating new communities where excluded ones are included. Then of course the third is the Last Supper. Then the fourth is breaking the bread with his disciples after resurrection. We have it uh, in Luke chapter 24, John 21, etc. So all these four types of meals in the life of Jesus have Eucharistic significance. And meals were in uh, Jesus' time privileged occasions to gather a people, not just, uh, not just uh, to, uh, uh, you know, just to taste the food, but more importantly, to taste the reign of God. In the ministry of Jesus, they stood for the foretaste of a new humanity that was longed for. Hence, our Eucharist way should assume the meaning that is signified by all these meals and not merely the Last Supper. These meals refer to justice, compassion, an inclusive community, mission, and a reconciled human community. All these dimensions have to be intrinsic to our Eucharist today 
if we wish to realize its full significance. If so, we must consider how Eucharistic meal has to be preceded by an Eucharistic toil. <clears throat> Why do I say this? We have in uh, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 10 says, the one who does not work has no right to eat. <clears throat> now, this applies also to the Eucharistic meal. <clears throat> and therefore, what is the Eucharistic toil that should precede the Eucharistic meal? If toil is intrinsic part of the meal, what is the Eucharistic toil that should precede the Eucharistic meal? It is the participation in the ministry of Jesus. And this is obligatory for all the participants of his meal. The Eucharistic meal at the end sends forth the participants to toil further. The ministry, that is the toil, the Last Supper and death on the cross, is one integral Eucharist of the whole life of Jesus. And we are invited to make our whole life an integral Eucharist of this type. Let us talk about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. A very prominent theme, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. In the Corinthian text that I read out, and even if you read a little further there, in the Corinthian text, Eucharistic text, the primary reference to the Eucharistic presence of the Lord is to his presence in the community. It is the community that is symbolized by the bread and wine. <clears throat> bread and wine are made by grinding the individual wheat and corn and by crushing the individual grapes respectively. We have this in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17. And that is why bread and wine symbolize the community where individuals are invited to transcend their egoistic interests and become a community. The presence of the Lord in the consecrated bread and wine is true, but only because, but not only because the celebrant has uttered the words of consecration on them, but also because the bread and wine represent the community. And unfortunately today, over the centuries, a reversal has taken place. Namely, the symbol that is bread and wine has replaced the symbolized, that is the community. And as a result, one can do away with the community. It is enough to have bread and wine for the Eucharistic celebration. And this great reversal has to be reversed once again. For this, we draw support from the Corinthian text that sharply criticizes the Eucharistic celebration in a community that is ruptured, broken, and insulted. This is because in such a celebration, the reality of the Eucharist is missing because, primary, because the primary place of the Lord's presence, that is the community itself, is missing. Hence, such a celebration becomes an empty symbol, a mere devotion, and not a transformative sacramental act. And hence, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 to 30, the text warns us. It says, For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, what is the meaning of that phrase, discerning the body? The discerning the body means being conscious of the reality of the community. The community indeed is the context of the Eucharistic celebration. Community here means not just a group of people, but the disciples who are gathered around the Lord with a vision of and a commitment to the Lord's mission. The image of the body in the Corinthian text from chapter 5 to chapter 15 in that first Corinthians, first letter to the Corinthians, there are about eight themes concerning the body. Now, for example, the sentence 
that we find in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 17. It's a sentence there. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. That makes the culmination of the Eucharistic discourse. Clearly then, body of Christ is not merely the sacred species of bread and wine. Most essentially, it is the community of the participants. And it is to this body, the resurrection is promised. Hence, in the early Christian liturgies or liturgies in the early uh, churches, in the, in, in the beginning of Christianity, the invocation of the spirit was made both on the community and on the bread and wine. We have this reference in the Lima document uh, uh, number 14. It is today we, the, the celebrant uh, invokes Holy Spirit only on the, the, the species of bread and wine. No, those days in the early church, it was invoked also on the community. And so the Eucharist is clearly placed in the context of the communion among the members. In fact, they make the body. Hence, the real presence of Christ is not to be restricted to the species of bread and wine. It has to be seen in the community of the participants as well, who participate in the toil and meal of the Lord. Therefore, the Eucharistic community needs to be respected along with the consecrated species of bread and wine. And therefore, Eucharist is not one devotion among many. Eucharist consists in participating in the toil of the Lord as much as in the meal of the Lord. Eucharist is the entire life of the toiling community of disciples, of which the Mass is the sacramental celebration. Therefore, Eucharistic devotion should not end up in reducing the Eucharist to a to a devotion or a cult, such a move goes against the very nature of the Eucharist. At the Eucharistic meal, one is graced and empowered to participate in the toil of the Lord, rather than merely to enjoy some cozy feelings. And therefore, there is a need for a meaningful reinterpretation of the sacrament of Eucharist today. Now we have traditionally in the catechism we have learned how do we define a sacrament. Sacrament is an external sign of, a, of the inner grace. Now that has to be reinterpreted today in the especially in the case of Eucharist namely Eucharist as a sacrament is a historical sign of the eschatological that means of the ultimate reality of the human community. Eucharist is a historical sign of the ultimate reality of the human community. The details of this historical sign need to be enacted in the community's actual day-to-day -day life. And Eucharist as the historical sign points to the final reality of the coming together of everything under Christ. And we have this in letter to the Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 in gathering of everything under Christ. This is the ultimate Eucharistic reality towards which the entire humanity is called. And in this sense, the historical sign that Eucharist is, is also a prophetic sign. If uh, Eucharist, you know, if Eucharist has to be a historical sign, it has to be also more than a noun. Eucharist has to be a verb. Now in Greek language, the verb, you know, the word Eucharist in English, it is coming from Greek, Eucharisto. It means I give thanks. It is a verb. Eucharisto in Greek, it means I give thanks. It is a verb. It is a subjective act. I give thanks and I am involved in this act of thanksgiving. One can ask why are you giving thanks, what has happened, etc. I give thanks because I see a reign of God community in humane, with humane relationships being built up. That is why I thank God. And that is the Eucharist. Building up of a kingdom community. 
I give thanks because I see this community involved in kingdom related toil and now has gathered round the Lord's table. That is why I give thanks. So that is the verb form of Eucharist. But if you take the noun form of the Eucharist, the, in Greek it is uh, eukaris, it means uh, good grace. Eukaris means good grace, eukaris, good grace. Now it is a noun which is out there, no one needs to get involved in it, etc. Now if you really think, unfortunately many concepts in the Christian tradition have been changed from their verb forms into noun forms. For example, love replaces loving. Love is a noun, loving is an act, verb. Love replaces loving. Community, the word community replaces communicating. It is a verb. Option for the poor is a noun. Many times replaces actual opting for the poor. Ministry replaces ministering and so on. So in this process, these verbs have lost their prophetic edge and are converted into tame nouns. An Eucharist, therefore, has to be understood as a prophetic verb, action-oriented verb. Without the ministry, the verb form, the last supper of Jesus would be an empty symbol, a tame noun, and Jesus' Eucharistic words would be meaningless. For how could he break the bread and say, this is my body broken for you, if in reality he did not break himself? Our Eucharistic celebration also can be an empty symbol. Our Eucharistic words can be meaningless if we do not participate in the toil of the Lord with selfless commitment. How would a meaningful celebration of the Eucharist look today? Eucharist begins in the life situation. It is celebrated at the altar, which we call Mass, and it continues in real life. Eucharist consists in being food for the other, a complete self-giving. Becoming food signifies the radicality of this giving. Just as food cannot be recognized as food as it gets completely integrated into the one who consumes it, thereby losing its identity, so radical is the demand of the Eucharist towards self-giving. Such is the radicality with which God gives God's self to us. God becomes one with us in his self-giving. How do we live the self-giving dimension of our Eucharist today is a question to be considered and pondered upon. Another dimension of Eucharist is the memory. The memory of Jesus at the Eucharistic celebration who gave himself in a self-sacrificing toil can be meaningless if this memory remains merely a mental act. Therefore, recalling needs to become a reenactment. Eucharistic celebration should refer to the following three memories. What are they? First, memory of Jesus, that is the past. We have the New Testament texts which help us to recall the memory of Jesus as the past memory, but that is not enough. Eucharist is also a present memory, that is uh, the experience of the risen Lord in the community, in the life situation of the community, and that is a present memory. And there is also a future memory, namely hope-filled expectation of the Lord's coming. So this is, these three are memories about Jesus, memory of Jesus. Then there is a memory of the community's life, past and the present. And there is also a third future memory of the community, that is its hope for the union with the Lord. Now when these three memories, memory of Jesus, memory of the community's life, and the future memory of the community, when these three memories are set in mutual dialogue, the memory of Jesus gets contextualized and concretized in the life of the community. Indeed, the Lord commands us, do this in my memory. Now what is this, this, do this, what is this? The this which we are supposed to do till he comes again must be understood not only 
the as the uh, eucharistic meal but very importantly also the selfless eucharistic toil doing this is doing the toil of the master only then repeating his meal can be meaningful eucharist in this sense is the reenacting of a very challenging memory memory of a man who relentlessly toiled all that is anti kingdom we have this in the document ecclesia the eucharistia number 4 it is the memory of a man who did not leave a stone unturned when it came to finding and doing the will of the father it is the memory of a man who did not count the cost of being cost in being faithful to his commitment to god it is the memory of a man who showed zero tolerance towards unjust and unkind situations it is the memory of a man who revolted against every form of oppression it is the memory of a man who liberated religion from empty cults and oppressive laws and redefined them in terms of mercy and compassion it is the memory of a man who doled out forgiveness in the very act of being killed it is the memory of this man that is recalled at the eucharistic celebration with a view that such a recalling would empower us to get involved in a similar toil in our own context indeed until and unless the recalling becomes reenacting the eucharist remains only at the level of celebration reenacting the memory brings eucharist in direct contact with life thereby facilitating its transformative power to be effective in the life of the community how do we understand the liturgy of the word today which is part of the eucharistic celebration liturgy of the word it is a dialogue between it is in a dialogue between the word of the scriptural text and the word that has radically made himself present in the flesh that the word of god for today emerges therefore bringing to the table of the lord our experience of our experiences of the word heard in the joys and sorrows cries and groans of our people and setting them in dialogue with the words of the scripture can make the liturgy of the word very fruitful finally at the end of the eucharistic celebration we don't have an ending there is rather a sending the closing of the liturgy is not simply an ending of a ceremony or celebration rather it is a sending therefore it is a missionary moment sending is the result of gathering the sent ones will be gathered once again from the scattered fields of mission and so the mass is surrounded by the eucharist of life in all directions so to say therefore the dynamism of the eucharist becomes the very rhythm of life of the followers of christ as a community rightly then the document deus caritas est given by pope benedict the 16th number 4 14 says an eucharist which does not pass over to the concrete practice of love is intrinsically fragmented i repeat an eucharist which does not pass over into the concrete practice of love is intrinsically fragmented dear brothers and sisters the prevailing pandemic situation <clears throat> has reduced the possibility of participating in the holy mass for many <clears throat> however in the light of our presentation and discussion it is clear that the no, that no pandemic can stop the eucharist of life as such maybe the possibilities of participating in the mass are reduced we know that but no pandemic no event can stop the eucharist of life as such one can still break oneself in myriad ways in selfless service as many are doing it already let our lives be part of the lord's eucharist and thereby an acceptable offering 
in the Lord's own self-giving to the hungry and the thirsty, the depressed and the desperate, the needy and the nobody, the distressed and the dying of our society, so that our Eucharist doesn't get restricted only to the so-called mass, but rather becomes the very fabric of our life. Thank you.